Good evening. You're listening to Booked for the Night, a nightly podcast that brings you the classics. I'm your host, Melissa Phillips. Tonight, we begin the classic ghost story, The Turn of the Screw, by Henry James. It's hailed as one of the most sophisticated ghost stories ever written and is best suited for those who are 15 years or older. We hope you enjoy it. Let's get started. The Turn of the Screw Preface The story had held us, round the fire, sufficiently breathless, but except the obvious remark that it was gruesome, as on Christmas Eve in an old house a strange tale should essentially be. I remember no comment uttered till somebody happened to note it as the only case he had met in which a visitation had fallen on a child. The case, I may mention, was that of an apparition in just such an old house as had gathered us for the occasion, an appearance of a dreadful kind to a little boy sleeping in the room with his mother and waking her up in the terror of it, waking her not to dissipate his dread and soothe him to sleep again, but to encounter also herself before she had succeeded in doing so, the same sight that had shocked him. It was this observation that drew from Douglas, not immediately, but later in the evening, a reply that had the interesting consequence to which I call attention. Someone else told a story not particularly effective, which I saw he was not following. This I took for a sign that he had himself something to produce and that we should only have to wait. We waited, in fact, till two nights later, but that same evening, before we scattered, he brought out what was in his mind. I quite agree in regard to Griffin's ghost, or whatever it was, that it's appearing first to the little boy, at so tender an age, adds a particular touch. But it's not the first occurrence of its charming kind that I know to have been concerned with a child. If the child gives the effect another turn of the screw, what do you say to two children? We say, of course, somebody exclaimed, that two children give two turns. Also, that we want to hear about them. I can see Douglas there before the fire, to which he had got up to present his back, looking down at the converser with his hands in his pockets. Nobody but me, till now, has ever heard. It's quite too horrible. This was naturally declared by several voices to give the thing the utmost price, and our friend, with quiet art, <clears throat> prepared his triumph by turning his eyes over the rest of us and going on. It's beyond everything. Nothing at all that I know touches it. For sheer terror? I remember asking. He seemed to say it wasn't so simple as that, to be really at a loss how to qualify it. He passed his hand over his eyes, made a little wincing grimace. For dreadful, dreadfulness. Oh, how delicious, cried one of the women. He took no notice of her. He looked at me, but as if instead of me, he saw what he spoke of. For general uncanny ugliness and horror and pain. Well then, I said, just sit right down and begin. He turned round to the fire, gave a kick to a log, watched it an instant. Then he faced us again. I can't begin. I shall have to send it to town. There was a unanimous groan at this, and much reproach, after which, in his preoccupied way, he explained. The story's written. It's in a locked drawer. It has not been out for years. I could write to my man and close the key. He could send down the packet as he finds it. It was to me in particular that he appeared to propound this, appeared almost to appeal for aid not to hesitate. He had broken a thickness of ice, the formation of many a winter, had had his reasons for a long silence. The others resented postponement, but it was just his scruples that charmed me. I adjured him to write by the first post and to agree with us for an early hearing. Then I asked him if the experience in question had been his own. To this, his answer was prompt. Oh, thank God, no! And is the record yours? You took the thing down. Nothing but the impression. I took that here, he tapped his heart. I've never lost it. Then your manuscript is in an old faded ink and in the most beautiful hand, he hung fire again. A woman's. She has been dead these twenty years. 
she sent me the pages in question before she died. They were all listening now, and of course there was somebody to be arch, or at any rate to draw the inference. But if he put the inference by without a smile, it was also without irritation. She was the most charming person, but she was ten years older than I. She was my sister's governess, he quietly said. She was the most agreeable woman I've ever known in her position. She'd have been worthy of any whatever. It was long ago, and this episode was long before. I was at Trinity, and I found her at home on my coming down the second summer. I was much there that year. It was a beautiful one. And we had, in her off hours, some strolls and talks in the garden. Talks in which she struck me as awfully clever and nice. Oh yes, don't grin. I liked her extremely, and am glad to this day to think she liked me too. If she hadn't, she wouldn't have told me. She had never told anyone. It wasn't simply that she said so, but that I knew she hadn't. I was sure I could see. You'll easily judge why when you hear. Because the thing had been such a scare? He continued to fix me. You'll easily judge, he repeated. You will. I fixed him too. I see. She was in love. He laughed for the first time. You are acute. Yes, she was in love. That is, she had been. That came out. She couldn't tell her story without its coming out. I saw it, and she saw I saw it, but neither of us spoke of it. I remember the time and the place, the corner of the lawn, the shade of the great beaches in the long, hot summer afternoon. It wasn't a scene for a shudder, but oh, he quitted the fire and dropped back into his chair. You'll receive the packet Thursday morning, I said. Probably not till the second post. Well then, after dinner? You'll all meet me here, he looked us round again. Isn't anybody going? It was almost the tone of hope. Everybody will stay. I will, and I will, cried the ladies whose departure had been fixed. Mrs. Griffin, however, expressed the need for a little more light. Who was it she was in love with? The story will tell, I took upon myself to reply. Oh, I can't wait for the story. The story won't tell, said Douglas, not in any literal vulgar way. More's the pity, then. That's the only way I ever understand. Won't you tell, Douglas? Somebody else inquired. He sprang to his feet again. Yes, tomorrow. Now I must go to bed. Good night. And quickly catching up a candlestick, he left us slightly bewildered. From our end of the great brown hall, we heard his step on the stair. Whereupon Mrs. Griffin spoke. Well, if I don't know who she was in love with, I know who he was. She was ten years older, said her husband. At that age? But it's rather nice, his long reticence. Forty years, Griffin put in. With this outbreak at last. The outbreak, I returned, will make a tremendous occasion of Thursday night. And everyone so agreed with me that in the light of it, we lost all attention for everything else. The last story, however incomplete and like the mere opening of a serial, had been told. We hand shook and candle struck, as somebody said, and went to bed. I knew the next day that a letter containing the key had, by the first post, gone off to his London apartments, but in spite of, or perhaps just on account of, the eventual diffusion of this knowledge, we quite let him alone till after dinner, till such an hour of the evening, in fact, as might best accord with the kind of emotion on which our hopes were fixed. Then he became as communicative as we could desire, and indeed gave us his best reason for being so. We had it from him again before the fire in the hall, as we had had our mild wonders of the previous night. It appeared that the narrative he had promised to read us really required for a proper intelligence a few words of prologue. Let me say here distinctly, to have done with it, that this narrative, from an exact transcript of my own made much later, is what I shall presently give. Poor Douglas, before his death, when it was in sight, committed to me the manuscript that reached him on the third of these days, and that, on the same spot, with immense effect, he began to read to our hushed little circle on the night of the fourth. The departing ladies, who had said they would 
would stay didn't, of course, thank heaven, stay. They departed, in consequence of arrangements made, in a rage of curiosity, as they professed, produced by the touches with which he had already worked us up. But that only made his little final auditory more compact and select, kept it round the hearth, subject to a common thrill. The first of these touches conveyed that the written statement took up the tale at a point after it had, in a manner, begun. The fact to be in possession of was therefore that his old friend, the youngest of several daughters of a poor country parson, had at the age of twenty, on taking service for the first time in the schoolroom, come up to London in trepidation to answer in person an advertisement that had already placed her in brief correspondence with the advertiser. This person proved, on her presenting herself for judgment at a house in Harley Street that impressed her as vast and imposing, this prospective patron proved a gentleman, a bachelor in the prime of life, such a figure as had never risen, save in a dream or an old novel, before a fluttered anxious girl out of a Hampshire vicarage. One could easily fix his type. It never happily dies out. He was handsome and bold and pleasant, offhand and gay and kind. He struck her, inevitably, as gallant and splendid, but what took her most of all and gave her the courage she afterwards showed was that he put the whole thing to her as a favor, an obligation he should gratefully incur. She figured him as rich, but as fearfully extravagant, saw him in a glow of high fashion, of good looks, of expensive habits, of charming ways with women. He had for his town residence a big house filled with the spoils of travel and the trophies of the chase, but it was to his country home, an old family place in Essex, that he wished her immediately to proceed. He had been left, by the death of his parents in India, a guardian to a small nephew and a small niece, children of a younger, a military brother who had lost two years before. These children were, by the strangest of chances for a man in his position, a lone man without the right sort of experience or a grain of patience, very heavy on his hands. It had all been a great worry and, on his own part doubtless, a series of blunders, but he immensely pitied the poor chicks and had done all he could, had in particular sent them down to his other house, the proper place for them being of course the country, and kept them there from the first with the best people he could find to look after them, parting even with his own servants to wait on them and going down himself whenever he might to see how they were doing. The awkward thing was that they had practically no other relations and that his own affairs took up all his time. He had put them in possession of Bly, which was healthy and secure, and had only and had placed at the head of their little establishment, but below stairs only, an excellent woman, Mrs. Gross, who he, he was sure his visitor would like and who had formerly been made to his mother. She was now housekeeper and was also acting for the time as superintendent to the little girl of whom, without children of her own, she was by good luck extremely fond. There were plenty of people to help, but of course the young lady who should go down as governess would be in supreme authority. She would also have, in holidays, to look after the small boy who had been for a term at school, young as he was to be sent, but, else, but what else could be done? and who, as the holidays were about to begin, would be back from one day to the other. There had been for the two children at first a young lady whom they had the misfortune to lose. She had done for them quite beautifully. She was a most respectable person. Till her death, the great awkwardness of which had, precisely, left no alternative but the school for little miles. Mrs. Gross, since then, in the way of manners and things, had done as she could for Flora, and there were, further, a cook, a housemaid, a dairy woman, an old pony, an old groom, and an old gardener, all likewise thoroughly respectable. So far had Douglas presented his picture when someone put a question. And what did the former governess die of, of so much respectability? Our friend's answer was prompt. That will come out. I don't anticipate. Pardon me, I thought that was just what you are doing. In her successor's place, I suggested, I should have wished to learn if the office brought with it. Necessary danger to life? Douglas completed my thought. She did wish to learn, and she did learn. You shall hear tomorrow what she learned. Meanwhile, of course, the prospect struck her as slightly grim. She was young, untried, nervous. 
It was a vision of serious duties and little company, of really great loneliness. She hesitated, took a couple of days to consult and consider, but the salary offered much exceeded her modest measure, and on a second interview she faced the music she engaged. And Douglas, with this, made a pause that, for the benefit of the company, moved me to throw in, the moral of which was, of course, the seduction exercised by the splendid young man. She succumbed to it. He got up and, as he had done the night before, went to the fire, gave it a stir to log with his foot, then stood a moment with his back to us. She saw him only twice. Yes, but that's just the beauty of her passion. A little to my surprise on this, Douglas turned round to me. It was the beauty of it. There were others, he went on, who hadn't succumbed. He told her frankly all his difficulty, that for several applicants the conditions had been prohibitive. They were somehow simply afraid. It sounded dull, it sounded strange, and all the more so because of his main condition. Which was that she should never trouble him, but never, never, neither appear appeal nor complain, nor write about anything, only meet all questions herself, receive all monies from his solicitor, take the whole thing over and let him alone. She promised to do this, and she mentioned to me that when, for a moment disburdened, delighted he held her hand, thanking her for the sacrifice, she already felt rewarded. But was that all her reward? One of the ladies asked. She never saw him again. Oh, said the lady, which, as our friend immediately again left us, was the only other word of importance contributed to the subject till, the next night, by the corner of the hearth, in the best chair he opened the faded red cover of a thin old-fashioned gilt-edged album. The whole thing took indeed more nights than one, but on the first occasion the same lady put another question. What's your title? I haven't one. Oh, I have, I said. But Douglas, without heeding me, had begun to read with a fine clearness that was like a rendering to the ear of the beauty of his author's hand. Chapter 1 I remember the whole beginnings as a succession of flights and drops, a little seesaw of the right throbs and the wrong. After rising in town to meet his appeal, I had at all events a couple of very bad days. Found all my doubts bristle again, Felt indeed sure I had made a mistake. In this state of mind, I spent the long hours of bum bumping swinging coach that carried me to the stopping place at which I was to be met by a vehicle from the house. This convenience, I was told, had been ordered, and I found, toward the close of the June afternoon, a commodious fly-in waiting for me. Driving at that hour, on a lovely day, through a country for the summer sweetness of which served as a friendly welcome, my fortitude revived and, as we turned into the avenue, took a flight that was probably but a proof of the point to which it had sunk. I suppose I had expected, or had dreaded, something so dreary that what greeted me was a good surprise. I remember as a thoroughly pleasant impression the broad, clear front, its open windows and fresh curtains, and the pair of maids looking out. I remember the lawn and the bright flowers and the crunch of my wheels on the gravel and the clustered treetops over which the rooks circled and cawed in the golden sky. The scene had a greatness that made it a dif different affair from my own scant home, and there immediately appeared at the door, with a little girl in her hand, a civil person who dropped me as a decent a curtsy as if I had been the mistress or a distinguished visitor. I had received in Harley Street a narrow no narrower notion of the place, and that, as I recalled it, made me think the proprietor, still more of a gentleman, suggested that what I was to enjoy might be a matter beyond his promise. I had no drop again till the next day, for I carried triumphantly through the following hours by my introduction to the younger of my pupils. The little girl who accompanied Mrs. Groves affected me on the spot as a creature too charming not to make it a great fortune to have to do with her. She was the most beautiful child I had ever seen, and I afterwards wondered why my employer hadn't made more of a point to me of this. I slept little that night. I was too much excited, and this astonished me too, I re recollect. Remained with me, adding to my sense of the liberality with which I was treated. The large impressive room, one of the best in the house, the great state bed, as I almost felt it, 
the figured full draperies, the long glasses in which, for the first time, I could see myself from head to foot, all struck me, like the wonderful appeal of my small charge, as so many things thrown in. It was thrown in as well from the first moment that I should get on with Mrs. Gross in a relation over which, on my way in the coach, I fear I had rather brooded. The one appearance indeed that in this early outlook might have made me shrink again was that of her being so inordinately glad to see me. I felt within half an hour that she was so glad, stout, simple, plain, clean, wholesome woman, as to be positively on her guard against showing it too much. I wondered even then a little why she should wish not to show it, and that re with reflection, with suspicion, might of course have made me uneasy. But it was a comfort that there could be no uneasiness in connection with anything so beatific as the radiant image of my little girl, the vision of whose angelic beauty had probably more than anything else to do with the restlessness that, before morning, made me several times rise and wander about my room to take in the whole picture and prospect, to watch from my open window the faint summer dawn, to look at such stretches of the rest of the house as I could catch, and to listen while in the fading dusk the first birds began to twitter, for the possible recurrence of a sound or two, less natural and not within but without, that I had fancied I had heard. There had been a moment when I believed I recognized, faint and far, the cry of a child. There had been another when I found myself just consciously starting as at the passage, before my door of a light footstep. But these fancies were not marked enough not to be thrown off, and it is only in the light, or the gloom, I should rather say, of other and subsequent matters that they now come back to me. To watch, teach, form, little Flora, would too evidently be the making of a happy and useful life. It had been agreed between us downstairs that after this first occasion, I should have her as a matter of course at night her small white bed being already arranged to that end in my room. What I had undertaken was the whole care of her, and she had remained just this last time with Mrs. Gross only as an effect of our consideration for my inevitable strangeness and her natural timidity. In spite of this timidity, which the child herself, in the oddest way in the world, had been perfectly frank and brave about, allowing it without a sign of uncomfortable consciousness, with a deep, sweet serenity, indeed, of one of Raphael's holy infants, to be discussed, to be imputed to her, and to determine us, I felt quite sure she would presently like me. It was part of what I already liked Mrs. Gross herself for, the pleasure I could see her feel in my admiration and wonder as I sat at supper with four tall candles and with my pupil, in a high chair and a bib, brightly facing me between them over bread and milk. There were naturally things that in Flora's presence could pass between us only as prodigious and gratified looks, obscure and roundabout allusions. And the little boy, does he look like her? Is he too so very remarkable? One wouldn't, it was already conveyed between us, too grossly flatter a child. Oh, miss, most remarkable, if you think well of this one. And she stood there with a plate in her hand, beaming at our companion, who looked from one of us to the other with placid heavenly eyes that contained nothing to check us. Yes, if I do, you will be carried away by the little gentleman. Well, that, I think, is what I came for, to be carried away. I'm afraid, however, I remember feeling the impulse to add, I'm rather easily carried away. I was carried away in London. I can still see Mrs. Gross's broad face as she took this in. In Harley Street? In Harley Street. Well, miss, you're not the first, and you won't be the last. Oh, I've no pretensions, I could laugh, to being the only one. My other pupil, at any rate, as I understand, comes back tomorrow? Not tomorrow, Friday, miss. He arrives, as you did, by the coach, under care of the guard, and is to be met by the same carriage. I forthwith wanted to know if the proper, as well as the pleasant and friendly thing, wouldn't therefore be that on the arrival of the public conveyance I should await him with his little sister, a proposition to which Mrs. Gross assented so heartily that I somehow took her manner as a kind of comforting pledge, never falsified, thank heaven, that we should on every question be quite at one. Oh, she was glad I was there. What I felt the next day was, I suppose, nothing that could be fairly called a reaction from the cheer of my arrival. 
It was probably at the most only a slight oppression produced by a fuller measure of the scale. As I walked round them, gazed up at them, took them in of my new circumstances. They had, as it were, an extent and mass for which I had not been prepared, and in the presence of which I found myself freshly, a little scared not less than a little proud. Regular lessons in this agitation certainly suffered some wrong. I reflected that my first duty was, by the gentlest arts I could contrive, to win the child into the sense of knowing me. I spent the day with her out of doors. I arranged with her, to her great satisfaction, that it should be she, she only, who might show me the place. She showed it step by step and room by room and secret by secret, with droll delight childish talk about it and with the result, in half an hour, of our becoming tremendous friends. Young as she was, I was struck, throughout our little tour, with her confidence and courage, with the way in empty chambers and dull corridors, on crooked staircases that made me pause, and even on the summit of an old square tower that made me dizzy. Her morning music, her disposition to tell me so many more things than she had asked, rang out and led me on. I have not seen Bly since the day I left it, and I dare say that to my present older and more informed eyes, it would show a very reduced importance. But as my little conductress, with her hair of gold and her frock of blue, danced before me round corners and pattered down passages, I had the view of a castle of romance inhabited by a rosy sprite, such a place as would somehow, for a diversion of the young idea, take all color out of storybooks and fairy tales. Wasn't it just a storybook over which I had fallen a, do a doze in a dream? No, it was a big, ugly, antique, but convenient house, embodying a few features of a building still older, half displaced and half utilized, in which I had the fancy of our being almost as lost as a handful of passengers in a great drifting ship. Well, I was strangely at the helm. Thanks for joining us for tonight's edition of Book for the Night. I'll be back tomorrow night with more of The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. Thanks for listening, and good night.